Welcome to Hope Unveiled, the podcast that guides you on a transformative journey toward a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We are Sunrise Church of Surrey, British Columbia, Canada, and our mission is to carry the hope and purpose of Jesus to those who may feel far from God. In each episode, we'll dive deep into the teachings of Jesus, offering practical insights and guidance for your faith journey. Whether you're taking your first steps in faith or seeking to deepen your existing relationship with Christ, we invite you to join us on this journey to embrace the hope that transforms lives. Take out your wallet. Everyone, if you have a wallet or a purse, I want you to pull out your, your wallet and, and then open up your wallet. Andre's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Nope. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> um, in your wallet, do you have a credit card or a rewards card? Anybody, by show of hands, who has a credit card or a, an award, a rewards card? Right? Most of us have. Now, your credit card probably has reward points with them, right? Most of you, if you're going to use credit, you might as well get a little something back, right? Whether it's points for purchases or travel. Anybody have like one of those, have a travel card or have a points card, right? Now, we have a, we have a card, we have a MasterCard, Costco MasterCard, and I like to save up my points, my save up my cash back for like bigger purchase items. Anybody like to save up their points or like you're not going to use your travel points for a hopper flight to Victoria, right? Like you're going to go at least to Calgary or somewhere hopefully more exotic, like maybe even Mexico. <laughs> right? Or I don't want to use my cash back points for, you know, cold medication or almond milk. I'm going to I'm going to leave it I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save those up. And I know that we have some, you know, bigger expenses. And so last year we got, last year we got some points. Uh, we got our check and I was like, I knew that it was coming. I was going to save it up. But out of sight, out of mind, and I forgot about it for a few months. And then I'm like, oh, this is, this is a bonus. It was, it was really wonderful to have. And now what, I, it wasn't like it's a paycheck, it was a bonus. It was a nice to have. The, the paychecks, I, I know when they're coming, and I'm not going to wait up, hold up for those because those are those what we use to pay our mortgage. That's what we use to pay our bills. But these rewards, they're like nice to have. They're bonuses. They're bonuses to something I'm, I'm kind of already doing but not essential to the day-to-day. And I'm going to suggest this morning that I think that Christians, many Christians, most Christians, Think of the spiritual gifts that way. That they're not actually central to our faith. That we, that we have, we understand Jesus. He's our king. He's our friend. We understand God the Father. He's the one that provides everything for us. But this Holy Spirit and his holy and spiritual gifts, what, these are a little bit of a mystery. And we're not quite sure what to do with them. So this morning, we're going to continue the series that Pastor Braden started last week, talking about the spiritual life, specifically spiritual gifts. And we're going to start with our scripture. And our scripture, we Hold the scripture as the word of God. It is our authority from which we teach from and from which we get um, a great deal of our instruction. It is divided, our Bible is divided into two parts, uh, and then it is further divided into books, chapters, and verses. And the two parts are, sur- are the writings surrounding covenants. And so in the first part of the book, it's called the Old Testament. It's part about the Old Covenant, the the law, and then the writings in the New Testament are around the New Covenant that we have in Jesus Christ. And so we are going to open up our Bible. I'm actually going to just read it to you this morning because I want to have the 
word wash over you. It talks, Paul talks in Ephesians about that we are cleansed through the washing, um, that we're through the reading of the words, the washing of the word over us. And so um, because we honor God's word as the authority in, our, in this place and, and for our lives, would you please stand as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, and then 4 to 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a variety of service, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge and to, according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, and to another gifts of healing by one spirit, to another the working of miracles, and to another prophecy, to another ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your gifts. We thank you that you have given to each one for the common good, that we would understand that you have even written in your word that you do not want us to be uninformed or ignorant about the things that you've given us. Lord, use these words this morning that we would be challenged by the words, that we would, that we would understand why we've been given these spiritual gifts and what to do with them. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your, that you are the teacher that we need, that, that, it's, that says you don't actually, we, even, we don't even need anyone except for you to teach us. So bless the words this morning. Amen. So would anybody here like to um, give themselves a little bit of accolades? Are you extravagant gift giver? Are you a good gift giver? Is there anyone here that would say, hey, I'm a good gift giver? Yeah? Like, yeah. What was the best gift that you gave? And a happy birthday to you, Courtney. <laughs> now, can you imagine if she didn't appreciate that gift? Right? We like, I, I would say that I, that I'm a, I'm a pretty good gift giver. I like to give extravagant gifts, not expensive. That doesn't mean expensive gifts. It just means the amount of effort that I think about giving a gift. Now, to my friends here who like, you haven't given me any gifts, but sometimes my friendship, Kevin, is the only gift you need. <laughs> That's the extravagant gift. No, I, so, so I have a friend who who uh, w was moving to the island, and she, was, she and her husband were building their dream house. They, so they were designing everything. And she's a, a cook and, and a host. She loves to host. And so the kitchen was going to be central to their, ki their design in the house. Everything was centered around her kitchen. And, and so I was trying to think of like an, a really great gift. She's a great gift giver, and I always feel so loved by the things that she gives to me. And I was trying to think of something that would be equally uh, meaningful and yet functional. I'm all about form and function. And so uh, someone had given me some these woven linen dish towels, kitchen towels. They're the, the most absorbent dish towels that you'll ever use. I love the towels. And they're beautiful. They're aesthetically beautiful. They are handmade, small batch, artisan made, and they're extremely functional. And so I gave her these t um, a couple of, or one actually, just one kitchen towel. And then it took a few months and I finally was able to go over to the island to see the, her home. 
And I could see that it was just, it was so nicely displayed on her, on her counter and in the center. Everybody could see this lovely, beautiful kitchen towel that I had made. And I'm like, but I noticed she wasn't using it. And she said she didn't want to ruin it. And I, and I said, so like, she has other kitchen towels that did the job. Nothing is nearly as absorbent as this, this towel, this woven linen towel. But it, so it would do the job, but it wasn't as effective as it could have been. So she wanted, she didn't want to use up the thing that, that I had given her. And here's the thing. Here's our myth number one, is that spiritual gifts are optional. You know, they're, they're good to do the job, but we have other means to get the job done. Right? Last week, I think one of my favorite things that, that Pastor Brayden was talking about was he said that spiritual gifts are not a sign of maturity. He, uh, he, it was Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says that the gifts that he gives us are without repentance, meaning that it is not nothing you do or don't do. You just have the gifts because when Pentecost fell, the Spirit was given and fell on all the people. And so it's not a sign of maturity whether you have the gifts. We just have the gifts, but they're not, they're not optional. They're actually essential to our Christian faith. We heard from Lido Marionette, and she was the way she just said, yes, yeah, she just goes, and, they, and people accept Jesus, and they see healings and raising the dead. Can you do that without the Spirit? Is it optional for you to go on mission without the spiritual gifts and Holy Spirit in operation? Right? It's, it's, not, it's not optional. It's essential to our faith. Now, they're essential. And all gifts for all the believers for the common good. For the common good. These are my notes, and I'm like trying to follow. <laughs> I'm like, I think. I... <laughs> what do you got? Yes, okay, okay, we're here. Yeah, they're for all people. And so I grew up in a sensationist uh, church. So cessationists would hold that the gifts are not in operation in, in today. So once the early church was established and the apostles, the original apostles died, then the gifts ceased. We didn't need prophecy to lead or to continue to guide because we now had the logos, the written recorded word, so we had no need of extra prophecies. We had all of it written down in our, in our Bible, in the canon. And so, I mean, and so if it wasn't completely cessationist, but if for those that, that might have had some gifts, they were, they were really for the elite. They were for the, the Christians that, well, definitely not a lowly Mennonite girl from the prairies, because girls didn't possess those kind of, it was a very patriarchal system, and girls did not possess those kind of extravagant elite gifts. But as I grew up and I started to examine the scriptures for myself, I was probably, um, that was God's gift. It was when I went to a Bible school, it wasn't about academics. It was about learning how to be a self-feeder. And when I started to look into this, into the gifts, and, I, and in, even into Jesus' ministry and life, he did a lot of miracles. Did you know that? Like, people were raised from the dead. He was multiplying food, like, left, right, and center. Like, he, was, he multiplied food several times. Lots of people were healed. And then in Hebrews 13.5, it says, 13.8, it says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm like, well, you must still be doing miracles. You must be. Even though they're not in evidence in my life, or even like they, I didn't. They weren't even 
uh, urban legend. Like, they were just urban legend at this point in my life. There was nothing where people were experiencing or witness, witnessing miracles uh, and, the, and the spiritual gifts. And so I kind of went on a quest. I'm like, I believe the word. I don't believe my experience is not what the word says. And so I'm going to go look for that. And what I wanted, I, didn't, I wasn't even anticipating that I, they would be manifested in me, but that I just could be in the room when miracles or prophecy was being spoken. I just wanted to be a witness because they were not essential for me. I had Jesus and the Word. I didn't need, they were just nice. They're, they're for like other better people, not me. But I, I knew Jesus is like that. That's my Jesus. That's the one I follow and I'm gonna be in the room. And I began, to, uh, I began to search that out and, and seek it out. And then and I really did, did come to this realization that it is through our hands, right? He gives us, it's through our hands that, that Jesus performs miracles. It's, it's through the spiritual gifts that he gives us that was recorded. There's this great quote by Gordon Fee. Can you put it out? I actually don't have it in my notes. I have to read it here. The secret to the success of the early believers in their culture lay first with their good news centered in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, but their success also lay with their experienced life in the Spirit who made the work of Christ an effective reality in their lives, thus making them a radical alternative within their culture. It wasn't the fact that they preached the life, death, and resurrection, which is what we preach. Most, all Christian churches will preach the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what that was also central to their life was the idea that this, we could not do life without the Spirit. They could not do life without the Spirit. It made the work of Christ, in a, it was an effective reality in their lives. Without the gifts of the Spirit, without the manifestation of the Spirit, it, it makes Christ ineffective. The message can't be believed. It actually says the, the message of Christ in the doctrine of Christ, there's a little list of, in Hebrews 6 about, it talks about the, the elementary doctrine of, of Christ, the elementary doctrine of Christ. And it talks about believing in, in Jesus and the life, death, and the resurrection. But it also says that, that part of the elementary doctrine that we should be doing at the very least is resurrecting the dead. That's the basic elementary, and then you get to the advanced. Can we do that? Can you, can you resurrect the dead without the, mir the gift of miracles? Can you do that without the Spirit? We can't. The other myth, myth number two, not the other, there's, more, there's probably more myths. We're only going to cover two today. Myth number two is that spiritual gifts are only used in extraordinary circumstances. Like, like the rewards, we're saving them up. We don't want to use them for a common cold. This week I had a cold, and I have to say that it's not generally my go-to. Like when I have a cold, it's not my go-to to pray about it or ask other people to pray. I'm not going to involve anybody else in my cold. The cold will pass in, you know, in a week or so and you'll be back to normal. But I knew that the lesson, the sermon was coming up and I knew that I was going to be talking about it. So I said, I'm praying about it and I am going to ask people to pray about it with me um, because I didn't, I couldn't afford to be fatigued or have brain fog as I was planning and you know what? I, the cold, uh, it, within two days, it was, I still have a little bit of the congestion, but that cold, the, the crux of the cold was, was gone in two days. 
And I was feeling a, a little puffed up about that. Uh, that, oh, like, look at me. Here's my object lesson for exactly not saving it up for the big things. And then Holy Spirit says to me, you only did that because you wanted something, not because you had faith for it. So I got deflated a little. But he, and then he said, you rob God the glory of showing up in your experience with his presence and reality. Common cold, cancer, it doesn't matter. We don't have to save up. I know there's a, a number of friends who have talked about that they have a variety of different problems in their family household, some, some physical, some, some were like a relational. And, uh, and I would say, oh, I want to pray for you. And they're like, well, no, don't pray for me. Pray for my son who needs it more. I'm like, well, no, actually, there's not a limit to what God can do. So we can pray for it all. And he can, I, I had last night, uh, we had a celebration for Kevin Gogol. It was what a joy for his birthday and what a joy to see Arlene Gogol in the house. And she hadn't been, at, at, most of you know that Dale has had some, has had cancer. Uh, not anymore. Not anymore, but he has kids. Yes, yeah. Uh, and so they have, they've been kind of outside, haven't been able to participate, just keeping, keeping them safe with, uh, with great crowds of people and all the germs that come with that. But it was really great to see Arlene, and she was talking about how she had years ago, when Kevin first went into Teen Challenge, she said that she had gotten, someone had given her a a painting, and it was called Beauty for Ashes. And, the, and she had said that that person had given her a word, didn't know who she were, was, but had given her a prophetic word that there was going to uh, be a full restoration. Now, that was how many years ago, and all of the things that has happened in their family, from Kevin to um, relationships to um, cancer and all the other things, and we're seeing a full restoration it's still in process. That's giving God the glory for showing up in the presence and making it the reality. Spiritual gifts demonstrate the presence and reality. I'm going to put up the next, yeah. His reality in our life. In Mark 2, it's the story of the paralytic man. You're probably familiar with it. If you've heard any of the Bible stories as a kid, this is, can you imagine the scene? Like, we're a pretty full crowd, but this, in, in someone's house, there was standing room only. There was no way, there was crowds of people were around Jesus because he was so, everybody who came to him was healed. And so that kind of brings the crowd. And uh, a, a, a man and four friends, it actually, the scripture does not say it's four friends. Now, a man and his friends brought him to Jesus. Now, they had to carry him because he was a paralytic man. And so there's no room. There's no way in. They made a very dramatic entrance. Like, that would be a way to step into the message. Just drop down right in front of Jesus. And so whatever Jesus was doing, he couldn't help but take care of the issue right in front of him because this paralytic man was dropped in front of him. And this is not a test, but does anyone recall what Jesus said to the paralytic man? You can call it out. He did say that, but first he said, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. The paralytic man dropped in front of Jesus the mirror, the, the, his fame of, of healing, injur, healing in illnesses. And he says, your sins are, it was the first time he had said that first. For, the first time it's recorded. And then there was murmuring. He said, he said, your sins are forgiven. As if he can do that. 
the, and, and it says the scribes were in that crowd. They were whispering to each other, like, who, how dare he? Your sins are forgiven. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, says, well, what's easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? He's like, just to show you that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, he said to the man, I say to you, get up and walk. Take up your mat and walk. The spiritual gifts that Jesus exhibited proved the presence and reality in his life, that he is our Savior. He is the one who is able to forgive our sins and heal our bodies. It proves the presence and the reality of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul talks about not speaking with wise words or persuasive words, but, with that, but his words are backed with power to demonstrate and showcase whom Jesus is. He had, did not separate the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and then the spiritual gifts were over there. He, he, didn't, he didn't separate them. It was part of his ex- experience. It was part of his Christian walk. It was normal Christianity. Acts 4, when Peter and John have been arrested for healing a man at Gate Beautiful, and they were let go, and they were instructed to stop preaching Jesus. And so the two of them go to their friends who are gathered, who had been praying for their, them in their release. He, went, he goes there, and he said, let's pray for more boldness to speak the words and for the Lord to back up their preach with signs and wonders. The signs and the wonders prove the presence and the reality of Jesus. In Exodus 33, in my, in my study this week, this, this passage was really beginning to, to rub me the wrong way. This passage in Exodus 33, it's in the beginning of the Bible, The Israelites were in the desert. They were about to go into the promised land. And they had, been, they had been wandering around in the desert. Moses had done what he was supposed to do. Honestly, the whole book of Exodus is such a great, great look at what leadership looks like, where Moses is saying, these people are you, these stiff-necked people that you gave me, Lord. And the Lord says, no, they're your people. And Moses is like, no, you're their people. And and I'm like, do you think that that's how our pastors pray for us? <laughs> like this, no, I don't want to take responsibility for them. But the, at this one point, the, they were, the Lord was just fed up. And he had done, but he's faithful to his word. He's, he, doesn't, he doesn't call you into something and then let you go on your own. So what he said um, in Exodus 33 was, I'm going to send my angel to go with you. I'll drive out all of the Hittites and Parasites, the, the, not Parasites, probably. <laughs> right. All the sites. But my presence will not go. And then, I mean, we know, if you've been in church for a while, you know that most, no, I'm not going to, I don't want that. But I just want us to camp right here for for a moment. The Lord was faithful to his word. He was going to bring them into the land that he promised them. But his presence was not going to go. And how and I just felt convicted like how many times have I started with the Lord? And I'm like, "Oh, I I got this. I got this." Oh, and I mean an angel obviously was pretty powerful, was going to knock out their enemies. So it wasn't like that they were left on their own. 
right? They had um, the angel of the Lord who had been right in the presence of, of right in the presence of the people, of, or, I mean, of the Lord. That's who God was going to send them. Like, that is a pretty good delegate. That's a pretty good delegate. Um, and how many, how many of us have started, the Lord says, go, we go. But we say, I don't actually need your presence because it's optional. It's optional. I mean, this is pretty good. What I've got is pretty good. But Moses, he knew. He was keenly aware of, of God's presence. He's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, I'm not going. Because if you don't come with us, how are the people going to know that you're with us? How are the people going to know that you are a good God? What are, how are they going to know the reality and presence of God? Pop up that garden feet quote again. I just want to read that again. The secret to the success of the early believers in their culture lay first with their good news centered in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But their success also lay with their experienced life of the Spirit, who made the work of Christ an effective reality in their lives, thus making them a radical alternative within their culture. Now, from Genesis to Revelation, it's the story of God with his people. He comes close, we go far. He, comes, he keeps coming close, we go far. He comes close and we're like, we're going to go into this land without you. We'll take your angel. We're okay with that. How many Christians are okay with that? I mean, I really felt convicted. That's where I was really camped on a lot of this, this week. In, in the preparation, the benefit of the preparation is that it hits my heart first. That we're okay with that. But, but that's what makes us the radical alternative. It's Jesus, his presence, and it's not just his presence. Worship was wonderful this morning, and it has been um, like a growing presence. We can, we can probably feel that presence, but it's not just the feeling. It's what we take when we go. Do you feel that presence when you go to work on Monday morning? And when you're doing, when you're doing going about your day do you feel the presence? Do you know that the presence goes with you? That that is the thing that makes Christians different. Every, yes, every day. It is what makes us different. Where when Jesus said, I'm going to go, but it's better that I go because what I'm sending you is the Holy Spirit, which is the presence, the eternal presence of God with us. That is Emmanuel, God with us. And the, and the proof of that is the, the spiritual gifts that he gives us. It is the demonstration. We actually called them the manifestation gifts. Esther Braden had a really cool slide last week where, where there was like, there's three passages and the 1 Corinthians 12 passage is all, they're called, the list gift is called the manifestation gifts. Now, manifestation means it's the proof of the reality. So if these are manifestation gifts, should they not be manifested in our lives to prove that we are the radical alternative in a culture that says Christianity, take it or leave it, it's kind of it's, it's six of one, half a dozen of another. It's the same thing as any other religion out there, or it's just an option. But what he's saying is that we have the presence of God, and that is what makes us different. How are we going to know? How are the nations going to know that we are different, that God is for us, if we do not demonstrate, if we do not manifest the gifts in our lives as part of our normal Christianity. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. (laughs) 
Matthew 14. That's where he talks, where he, Jesus does one of his multiplication miracles, where he feeds the 5,000. And we know the story that he broke the bread and gave it, and, and there was a bounty left over. But what he said to the disciples is so curious. He said, the disciples said, hey, there's a problem here. Uh, there's a lot of people, uh, Super Bowl party, big, like more people, and I don't have enough wings. What are we going to do? And, and, and Jesus says, you feed them. Well, don't have enough money for all you people. And he says, well, what do you have? And he performs the blessing. And then Jesus distributed it to the disciples, and the disciples distributed it to the people. Jesus is saying, you feed them, you heal them, you raise the dead. He gives to us, and then we give. As, as a, a, a royal priesthood, that, that's what we're called, you know that church? We're a royal priesthood. So the priests were, were to minister um, from God to the people. That they were to kind of explain God to the people. And so when we, when we have the resources of heaven, when we have the resources of the Spirit, that we can go into the Spirit, we have a responsibility to the nations to distribute what God has given to us. It is the manifestation of his presence. It's the reality of his presence. Spiritual gifts are the only way with, in which we can fulfill the Great Commission. Or in other words, it says, without spiritual gifts, it's impossible to fill the Great Commission. We're going to read, we're going to read the great, these words in the scripture. And because we honor God's word as our authority, would you stand again as I read Mark 16, 14 to 20? Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had saw him after he had risen. And when he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands, and they will drink any deadly poison. It will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. In verse 20, it says, And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them, and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Amen. Have a seat. Worship team, you can come up. Without the spiritual gifts in action, without manifesting the spiritual gifts, that list, that list of extraordinary gifts, it is impossible to fulfill the Great Commission. We're more, probably more familiar with the Matthew 28 Great Commission, which is going to all the nations and disciple the nations. How are we going to do that if we don't have the wisdom of God or the knowledge of God? Where there's, in our, in our community group this last week, we were talking about the gifts of the Spirit and, and operating in them. And someone like, why don't we go to the hospitals, into the ER, and start praying for people and clearing them out before they need to see a doctor and wait for eight hours to see a doctor? Why aren't we doing that? What do we, why am I doing that? That is, that is the gift 
of the Spirit that we have to be able to see him manifest and so that the world will know, the nations will know that God is with us. It proves his existence. It proves his presence with his people, not just on a Sunday morning worship when the worship feels so warm and wonderful. And it's a feeling, and it can, it, I mean, it's not a feeling, but it can feel like our minds can trick us and like, oh, that was just an emotional response to something that was happening. No, it is the presence of God that proves that he's with us. It makes us a radical alternative within a culture that needs to know that there's truth, that there needs to know that there's something different. In the New Age community, a lot of churches, we keep the spirit away. Now the New Age community, they bring it in and they're like, um, God is in me, God is me. So there's a twist, right? They recognize that there's something in turn, that God is inside, but, but they elevate themselves. It's not about elevating us. It's not, Paul was not elevating himself in in saying, I'm doing this, but his spirit and the Holy Spirit were so intertwined. We have a spirit, people. We have our own spirit. If you read scripture, there's a small S. So anytime there's a small S as you're reading the scripture, it's talking about our spirits that God has given us, made us with and then Holy Spirit. So it's not about us doing it. We cannot manufacture anything. This is stepping into the Spirit, living life by the Spirit that we do. So what do we, what do, we do? I mentioned, I mean, maybe we should have a, a response, emergency response team that we're going into emergencies and praying and releasing you guys are going. You're going to be going in the Spirit, and you know that you're going to be seeing miracles. You're going to be experiencing miracles. They will happen at your hand because the Lord has gifted you everything that you need already. Marcy, everything you need, the Lord has gifted you already. You have it. Heather, you have what you need. There is um, a word, if you, last week in the bulletin, if you get the e-bulletin, there was uh, a prophetic word that was the, the full written prophetic word that the prophetic company has, has um, heard the Lord, and it's in a written form. There's some pretty miraculous things that are going to happen. And I want to read, not going to read the whole word. I'm going to read the word to you, and then I want to have our response. And because we value the word of the Lord, and I'm going to be reading a prophetic word that the Lord has released over sunrise for 2024, would you please stand as I read? Also, I don't want you to fall asleep. Where my spirit is, there are miracles, healing, and provision. Walk in faith, hand in hand with me, believing that my presence is the source. There will be an increase in hearing my voice, even among the children and youth. You will not lack anything, miracles, physical healing. I'm also healing spiritual wounds and offenses in your midst. The Lord is calling us to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Spending time with me in private encounters will lead to action. Faith without action is dead. What do we do with the word of the Lord to Sunrise Church? What is our response in using the spiritual gifts that we cannot, no, we, we can no longer not operate and Give the world the gift that it needs. It needs to know that Jesus is real. He, the world needs to know there is the reality of his presence, that there's hope and purpose in his presence. 
And this might be just a little bit sobering in how much we have been able to accomplish without His Spirit. But today, I think Holy Spirit is saying, will you let me in again? And if that's your heart, I just want, I want you to put a hand over your heart as we pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you. You've given us everything we need that these gifts are not optional, that they are central to our faith as much as the resurrection of Jesus, that they actually um, demonstrate the reality of the resurrection uh, of Jesus. We repent, Lord, where we have not operated in the gifts, that we have turned aside, that we have ignored them, that we have thought that we would go with your angel instead, thinking that that was enough. But we say like Moses, do not send us. We have to have you. We cannot disciple the nations. We cannot do the great commission. We cannot destroy the works of the enemy as you've called us to do. We cannot partner with you if we do not have the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we we repent that we have when we have done that. We come to you afresh this morning and we ask you, in humbleness that we come before you, knowing that it is central to the work of the cross is to to be the demonstration and the manifestation, that we would be a people with a radical alternative within our culture, that it would be the effectiveness of, of Christ's work on the cross. Holy Spirit, I thank you. Amen. I just want to say one more thing that in hearing, in light of our our, uh, uh, sermon series on the spiritual gifts, we will be offering the spiritual, um, a hearing God course again in March 2nd. It's a Saturday. It'll be a 9 to 12. There it is right behind Gary. There's the QR code. (laughs) There's also registration. We're going to be talking about um, how God speaks. What is a false prophet? We don't want to go out and false in the world, but we want to know what a false prophet is, understanding the gift of prophecy. It's one of the gifts in the demonstration and the manifestation of the Spirit. It's something that we should be doing, not just on Sundays, but on Monday mornings when you go to work. You should be prophesying into your workplace. You should be prophesying to your coworkers. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can register for that. Let's worship. Thank you for listening to Hope Unveiled. If you're interested in learning more about what you heard today, or if you would like us to pray for something specific for you, we invite you to connect with us on our website, sunrise.ca.